Call the meeting to order. This meeting is being recorded. And I think the first thing we need to do is uh, a roll call. So uh, do you want me to do that or would you like to do that, Stephen? Uh, if, if members want to go around and, and just introduce yourself, I know yeah. uh, most, most folks here on the call know each other, but uh, that might be uh, a good place to start and that can serve as the, uh, the roll call. And I'll, I'll call on you. So uh, uh, Ron, if you want to start. Hello, this is uh, Ron Smith and uh, I'm here present at the uh, PS Lit meeting for uh, the date of 6 10 2021 and I'm having trouble with my e my uh, video conferencing right this moment so pardon me and your city council member district what oh thank you Jim that's okay city city council member district three and Jeff if you want to go next Jeff McKim, Monroe County Council at large. And Sue? Sue Scambaluri, Bloomington City Council, representing District 2. And Jim? Jim Sims, um, City Council at large and current Council President. And Scott? I'm Scott Oldham, the Eldsville Town Council. I'm Ward 3, and I'm also the current sitting uh, Council President. And not here today are uh, Isabel Piedmont Smith uh, with the City Council, uh, I believe Cheryl Munson with the County Council, and Lois Purcell uh, sitting in for the Steinsville Town Council. And uh, we put together an agenda. Um, and one of the first things on that is an election of the chair uh, who can then take over running the meeting. So um, I, would, I would recommend that the committee. Uh, take up any nominations for a chair first. Does anybody want to be president? Or a chair? Why don't you do it, Ron? Well, uh, be before we do that, uh, is there an informal round robin um, type thing? And what I mean by that, I do know, I think um, um, three years ago it was Isabel, and then I think it was Scott. And then it was Cheryl last year. Um, so is it like a round robin thing? We go from one unit to the next? I would hope we would do something like that, yes. That way we're all sharing in the, the leadership and the burdens of this council. Okay, I mean, I didn't, didn't know there's nothing written or anything about that, um, but that seemed to have been the way it was going. Um, if that's the case, then I guess it would be a city council person uh, don't have to be. I'm not just saying that seems to be the rotations going. Jim, do you have an interest in serving in that leadership role? Sure. Um, <laughs> not, uh, not if you would like to do it. <laughs> or, I, or, or, or Council Member Smith. Either one is fine. Um, it, I, if we I, have, if we have no one, I would do it. But. You know, being the council president and all that, I've got kind of a full plate. I, I would be happy to do it unless, um, Sue, you'd like to do it or Jimmy. Like Ron, it. please go ahead. You're in. Um, Cheryl, Cheryl mentioned to me last year, I think I served as vice president last year, and uh, she said, well, you're up next. So I'm, I'm happy to do it. Um, uh, I know that I'll get a lot of help with you all to uh, put the report together and get it um, uh, executed correctly. Um, so, um, I'm happy to do that unless someone else wants, you know, to, uh, step in there and do it. I nominate Ron Smith as chair of the committee. Second. 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 <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, do we need a vote, Stephen? Yes. Yes. I'll, I'll just call on you one at a time. Uh, Ron. Yes. Jeff. Yes. Sue? Yes. Jim? Yes. And Scott? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you all. And uh, uh, Stephen, do you have the agenda in front of you that you can put up for me? I do, yes. I'm happy to display it. The, the next item up uh, on the agenda is an overview of the local income tax rates, revenues, and distributions. Uh, 
uh, just a general overview, I, and I believe Jeff Underwood is here uh, and able to speak to that. Um, Jeff, are you able to? Okay, thank um, you. Sure. Um, uh, Mr. Underwood, if you'd like to present for us, that'd be great. Jeff, we're not, I don't think we're hearing you. It helps if you actually turn the microphone off on while you unmute it. So I was unmuted, but no microphone. <laughs> Sorry about that. Good, good afternoon. Good to see everybody again, our annual trek down the PS Lit uh, Trail. Um, I'll be very brief. Um, last year, uh, we were certified to receive $9,459,193. And just as a reminder, uh, we'll get certified again uh, around August the 1st. Uh, I know Mr. McKim and I will uh, look uh, forward to those because it, it's uh, a big number for both for our local budgets as well as, as for public safety. Uh, but that gets guaranteed for the following year. So once they certify these amounts, uh, you're guaranteed to get those. Uh, I, I'd like to report uh, what I think is good news on two fronts is uh, we again received, and that would be all units of government, including uh, PS LIT, uh, excess distribution from the trust fund uh, some background is that the state uh, keeps a um, trust amount back, and that's essentially to guarantee the, so that you can guarantee for the that that following year that you're going to receive the certified shares. If it if it exceeds a certain amount, then it gets distributed, and we all get uh, very nice distributions uh, from that. Um, the, the other good news is to see uh, not a decrease, but at least break even to an increase and um, uh, in the lit. So that is uh, very good news for uh, Monroe County, for all of the units of government uh, that received uh, lit, both uh, regular shares and PS lit. And uh, just to give you some idea that if there was a 3% increase in that, uh, that would give us uh, an additional 200 and almost $84,000 that would be available uh, for the uh, four units um, to get distributed to them. Uh, other than that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Underwood. Uh, do uh, committee members have questions for Mr. Underwood? Jeff, I... did you mention when do we anticipate getting um, final numbers? I know it's on further down in the year, but when do you anticipate that we would get that? August 1st. August 1st, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sims. Uh, anyone else have uh, questions for Mr. Underwood? And I can only see a few of you on the screen, so um, you can speak up or um, yell out or whatever. Any questions there, Mr. Oldham? Mr. McKim? I do not. Ms. Scambelluri? Yep. Okay. All right. Well, then, um, I guess that's short and sweet. Um, Stephen, is there anything else uh, we need Mr. Underwood for for the moment? Uh, it doesn't sound like it. Um, next up on the agenda, uh, we had uh, reserved a space to hear an update from uh, dispatch on uh, their 2021, sorry, 2021 budget. Um, and I believe Amy Hensley is here uh, to uh, just give a brief uh, overview. Um, Amy, are you able to unmute? I know you were having some audio issues. Hi. I called in on my phone because I couldn't get my computer microphone to work. Can yes. you hear me? Thank you. Yes. We can hear you okay. now. Go ahead. Uh, so far, we are right on track with uh, our, our expenditures. Uh, in fact, we're a little under with our expenditures. In salary, because we've had several vacancies this year, as of May 11th, we've only used 24% of our salary. Uh, we would only, as of May 11th reports, we had only used 20% of, of our overtime salary that we had budgeted. 
So we're doing very well with that, but we are working hard to try to get our staffing levels up. Right now we have 11 vacancies that we're trying to fill. So we have an open hiring process and we are in the interview process for that. Uh, other things are running like office supplies where 47% uh, institutional supplies were at 11.9%. So we're running pretty well. Um, the communications contract expenditures were at 34 and a half percent. One of the things that we found that we're anticipating being a lot higher uh, is our liability and casualty premiums have gone up. The building repairs seem to be going up a little bit. Other than that, expenditures are pretty well right on track. For next year, I would like to, COVID had hit us kind of hard and I'd like to get a couple of remote call taking positions that we can utilize if we have to vacate the center or if we have to run a backup at, at some location. And um, I don't have a lot else to tell you. Do you have questions for me? Um, Mr. McKim, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Hensley. I was just wondering if that uh, that number of vacancies is abnormally high, uh, and if so, if there's if you think I mean I know a lot of employers have been uh, struggling to be able to recruit employees. I'm wondering if, if if there's particular issues with the compensation for these positions, or if you have any other insight. We would like to see the compensation go higher. The um... The state did a survey on salaries across the state and what dispatch centers were paying. And one of our problems is our base salary is is just under 40 right now. And Morgan County this year put their base at 45. So the recording has know, stopped. So our, our this meeting is being recorded. Us, are some of them are a little lower than us, but there are some that are higher, and it's not a very far compute. So, so that's an issue. But dispatch centers clear across the nation are having serious shortages. There was an article about a month ago about a center that they had been sending all their calls to Raleigh, North Carolina, because. They just couldn't get people to show up to work. So, so there's, there's some major staffing issues everywhere, I think. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you, Mr. McKim. Um, anyone else have a question for Ms. Hensley? Ms. Scambellari? Thanks. Thanks, Ms. Hensley. Um, are there, I, I actually had the same question as, uh, Council Member McKim, is there any special um, incentives, hiring practices, hiring strategies that we have in place? Um, because it sounds like if we actually fill all those positions, our salary budget isn't going to be at 24% this time next year. Um, so I'm trying to think ahead on that. So We don't have any financial incentives uh, like sign-on bonuses or anything like that. Uh, as, as far as hiring strategies, we're just, we're trying to do one hiring process behind another hiring process. We advertise on mm -hmm. social media. Um, you know, we don't have a specific strategy, I guess. Okay. So we haven't identified new avenues for outreach or it, it seems like the biggest issue right now, if I'm understanding correctly, is generating candidates for these jobs, um, not necessarily doing interviews. It sounds like doing the interviews isn't a problem. It's just getting candidates. Um, we get a lot of candidates, but in our last hiring process, we had a lot of people that when we called them for interviews would not return our calls. We had five people that Yes, they were very interested, they said. They set up interviews, and then they were a no-call, no-show for their interview. 
hmm, we, and I don't know if it was the case or not, but we couldn't help but wonder if maybe some people were just checking the boxes for getting their unemployment checks. Because I, I know there's some kind of stipulation that you have to make so many contacts. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, thank you for kind we of fleshing that out a bit. We, we also lost a few people um, that when they put in notice, they had their current employers say, well, would you stay if, if we upped your salary by 10000 and they would turn around, call us back and say, I know I said I'd take the job, but my current employer just, you know, up to my salary. I think I'll stay where I'm at. So we lost a few people to that. Interesting. Okay. Thank you for, for kind of filling in some of those details. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Mr. Sims, please. Thank you. Um, Prime Minister Sims, Liam, thank you for... Um, joining us in, in that report. Um, I believe, if I'm correct, that the Central Dispatch Policy Board's budget session will be next week, I, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, so That's correct, as, on as Tuesday. Part, okay, and as part of the budget calculation or, or um, proposal, I guess, I'm sure that will include um, all of the vacancies um, for a full personnel position. Yes. Yes. And the, okay. the Novak consulting firm had recommended that overall, in order to handle the large call volume increasing, that we up our staffing by nine and a half positions. So last year, if you remember, we added three and a half positions. And next year, because we were on a three-year plan, next year, we had intended to add three more positions. So I have also added that to the budget for staffing. Okay, so after the meeting on Tuesday, you, it, it may not be totally final, but you have a real close version of the proposed budget for 2021, I'm sorry. Uh, I believe so, yes. Yeah. Yes, okay, I'm sorry. Getting my years mixed up, I wanna say 2021. 2022. Be 2022, yes. Um, okay, Michael, thank you. Council and, Member Sims, Michael yes, Rooker, I just wanna jump in real quick. I think it's, we're still working on the budget, so there is no budget proposal out there. There are discussions that still have to happen, so I would be very cautious about uh, making any assumptions about what will or will not be in the budget or commenting on it at this point. There is a special session scheduled on Tuesday for the Dispatch Policy Board to consider the 2022 a recommendation on the 2022 dispatch budget, but there's no guarantee that that will be recommended on Tuesday. Uh, the interlocal dictates that the Policy Board issue a recommendation by June 30th, so it, you may or may not have a recommended budget next Tuesday. Uh, if not, you know, the policy board would schedule a subsequent meeting. We've seen that happen before. So just, I'd just be a little bit cautious about making any assumptions on that front. Oh, thank Sorry you, Mr. Wicker. No, 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 you're fine. Um, I wasn't assuming, I was just asking. Um, but thank you for that clarification. And lastly, Ms. Hen uh, Hensley, you mentioned uh, bot call volumes increase. Can you give us an idea of how much that have increased um, up to this point? I don't have stats in front of me. I can email those stats out. Um, but staffing minimum is, is currently at four. And as we get staff up, we intend to increase that to five and sometimes six. But the staffing minimum was at four back in, in the 1990s. So we've seen the county and city grow, we've seen social changes, and what was determined back then as the needed minimum staffing has not changed. The needs have changed, but the ability to up, up our staffing has, has just not accommodated more yet. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sims. Uh, are there other questions from committee members? Uh, Ms. Scandalori? Thank you. And, and just to follow up on that, that's an interesting point about our population having grown but are not staffing up in, in terms of, of operators. Do we have any data to run, run alongside that about response times 
lengthening or anything like that? In other words, do we know the consequences of not having increased our, our staff? Does that question make sense? I have, it does. Uh, I don't know that uh, response times have really increased a lot. That would be something you would have to ask response departments. I know they are constantly working to improve their technology and their ability to respond in a quicker format. The, the goal of the protocols that we brought on board this year, we started with them February 23rd. And although there is an adjustment period anytime you implement a new software and a new system, the, the statistics behind the protocol is that it increases um, or speeds up your response times. It not only speeds up response times, but it also provides better data to responding units. And so, um, we're we're still in the initial phase of that. We brought it on February 23rd, and every month we've seen our numbers in in stats improve. Mm -hmm. But we still have a ways to go. And they say that the the learning curve and adjustment period is anywhere from six months to a year, depending on on how many calls you handle and what size your staff is, and whether or not you are implementing one protocol, two protocols, or three protocols, and we implemented two. We implemented fire and EMS in February, and the police protocols we plan to implement next year. Okay. So it would it be accurate to say it sounds like our not growing staff has been able to keep up with the needs of a growing population, but mostly because of technology, not because we've increased our staff. Absolutely. Got it. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. If I can make You're a welcome. On that. Just kind of, sorry, Ron. Um, Sue, I think the question you were after was, was right on point, but it's only half of the question. Because the dispatchers are not only taking 911 calls, they're also responsible for radio interaction with the ambulances, the fire trucks, and the officers on the street. Uh, and I will tell you, they are at absolute maximum capacity at this point. While they have done yeoman's work in getting the calls out, the problem is there are more calls that are more intricate that, quite frankly, the radio traffic back and forth, they've done great work. They, they're they very professional. They've done great work keeping up with it. But at certain points, they are, to use a computer analogy, the hard disk is just maxed out. There's not going to be any more coming in. You can't push any more in there. And they're there. And they're there a lot. Um, so there's not a surge capacity, as it were. If you have a tornado warning or if you have a major event whether that be a structure fire or something like that they're already maxed out and ask them to go more and more and more we're just not there it, it's they're going to have to have more capacity they're going to have to have more reserve capacity to assure everyone that as time goes on that center can cope with anything that gets thrown at them and again don't get me wrong they have done that but they have okay. done that at the risk of what if the next shoe drops and we can't handle it um, there's been some, frankly, heroic work in there to get, get everything done, but we continue to risk that day in and day out that we're going to go past their on-duty capacity, and that's, that's an issue that we as political bodies, all three of us, all four of us, need to address for the safety of everyone. Okay. That, those two answers together actually helped me quite a bit, so thank you for that. Well, and one of the thank things you. that we have had to do to help with, with the volume is our supervisors have had to to fill seats to pick up the slack and and then at that point they're not able to oversee and and supervise and deal with with some of the difficult things that they would normally be helping with instead they're just grabbing call after call after call and although the technology has helped us keep up in some ways in other ways the technology creates more work for us because now when before maybe we were only processing a phone call and radio traffic, now we're processing a phone call, radio traffic, mapping data, information coming in from your car computers, um, maybe, maybe text messaging and video chatting. And so the technology 
is giving us a lot more, but at the same time, we've got a lot more different, uh, um, different platforms that we are, are grabbing data from. So it actually creates even more per call to process. Interesting. Got it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. McKim. Thanks. And so I don't want to belabor this, but it does kind of, I mean, this is, is interesting and uh, it does kind of bring up the, the question of, of surge capacity in general. I mean, what are the best best practices for being able to provide surge capacity? Is it just you have enough employees then you can call call in overtime and, and uh, be able to call in enough overtime to be able to handle the surge? I mean, it's, it seems like it's specialized enough that you couldn't really have a, a reserve core or anything like that. Jeff, real quick, and I'll let Amy weigh in, but where I was talking about surge capacity, that happens in three seconds. You know, you may go from doing absolutely nothing to the whole world just literally being on fire around you. There's no time to call people from home. Okay. It's, it's much like a baseball team. If you've got to put in a pitch hitter, you can't wait for him to get from home. He's got to be right there right then. And these people do incredible amounts of work, an incredible amount of stress, and we've just got to do better by everybody because they are the core of everything that happens, whether it's police, fire, EMS. Um, so, yeah, I'm sorry, Amy, to intrude on that, but since I was the one that brought up surge capacity, I thought I'd address it. Well, so you're basically just saying higher baseline staff. Uh, in well, I mean, again, yeah. that's Amy, but that baseline staff is an incredibly high end baseline staff. It's incredibly, yeah. incredibly difficult skill set to master. Is there, is there a, uh, what is your solution to that, Scott, as far as they just need more trained personnel on, on site? Well, they are exquisitely trained. Um, they are going to have to have more people there. I mean, and she is absolutely correct. And, and again, having been involved with this for 32 plus years, those numbers have never changed, even when it was a split dispatch center between city and county. You had three and four dispatchers and that was it. And here we are 32 years later into my career and we still have three or four dispatchers and that is it. And folks, the whole world is much, much busier and it all starts with ground zero and that's dispatch. And she is having problems hiring. She is having problems retaining. She is having problems um, all along the frontier of what they do. Um, so yeah, we're going to have to provide more and we're going to have to do better all the way across the board. The technology has helped and that's been the stopgap. But when it comes down to three of the four people in the center being busy on 911 or being busy with calls and then something kicks off that happens in the blink of an eye where they've got to have that crucial radio set at some point, we're going to be found lacking. You were asking about call times. Uh, one of the contingencies that's built in for all 911 centers is that your neighboring counties do backup for you. So if, if there's, if we are just bombarded with calls and we're grabbing them as fast as we can, and we have, an, have more calls coming in than what we can pick up, they are set up to roll to one of our neighboring counties. And for us, our rollover goes to IU dispatch here in the city. And that helps, but at the same time, IU can't process our calls like we can. And so a lot of times they get key information, but then they have to hand it back to us. So, so it helps. Uh, if, if our calls were to go to say Brown County or Morgan County or something like that, they can grab the call but they don't have the capability to send our assets. So it helps a little, but, but it's not the answer. Mm -hmm. The answer is more, more, more people in the seat. Right. So the technology has allowed us to avoid catastrophe for the most part, but it's not optimal is what I hear you say. Right. Okay. Right. It looks like Ron left or, or lost his internet.
Mm. Well, which puts we... a damper on the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it looks like he's coming back. I'm sorry, I was going to say, until he gets back, do we have any more questions from Ms. Hensley? I do not. Nope, I don't. Thank you, though. I don't either. Okay. Um, I don't know if Councilmember Smith had any more questions. Uh, but Ms. Hensley, you'll stay on the line um, for a little while, correct? That's correct. Okay, so if he needs to ask you something else, um, um, You'll be there, so thank you. Um, Mr. Lucas, is that, until Mr. Until Councilmember Smith gets back, uh, are we done with that agenda item? It it's certainly sounds like that, and uh, if, if uh, Committee Member Smith is able to join back in, I'll, you, you may want to circle back with him, but uh, I'm happy yes. to uh, um, provide some background information on the next agenda item, which is the conduct of review of uh, applications and I believe everyone on this committee served uh, last year. So you'll remember that each year uh, qualifying service providers, so township uh, fire departments or volunteer fire departments or emerg emergency medical service providers um, are entitled to uh, apply for a distribution of the PS lit funding. And um, the review of those applications falls to the uh, Monroe County Tax Council, which has formed this committee for the purpose of, of accepting and reviewing those applications. Uh, the last two years, I believe, this committee has delegated the uh, responsibility of reviewing and making funding recommendations for those applications to the Monroe County Council. And uh, given the uh, eventual recommendation of this committee last year to, uh, to not award any funding to those township fire departments, um, the, the first question I've got for the committee is, how do you want to handle uh, reviewing applications this year? Um, I believe last year we received four, uh, four total applications from service providers. Um, I believe we are down to five qualifying uh, service providers that could apply if, if anyone, um, if, if I'm wrong, please correct me, but I, I believe it's, it's five uh, total uh, applicants that could apply. Um, Again, these, these folks are entitled to apply under state statute, and uh, I believe the adopting body is obligated to review those applications, uh, but, but not obligated to provide uh, funding. And uh, just, just by way of reminder, um, the PS lit funding uh, that is awarded to uh, the dispatch center is taken off the top of the total amount. Uh, any amount that is awarded to the uh, township fire departments or qualifying service providers uh, would then uh, be distributed next. And then what remains is divided up between uh, the city of Bloomington, uh, Monroe County, the town of Ellettsville and the town of Steinsville, according to a state formula. And so um, again, uh, my, my first question to you all is how do you wanna handle uh, reviewing applications? Um, the deadline for service providers to file applications is uh, June 30th, they, they have to submit those before July 1st. And in your packet, you will find uh, last year's application and guidelines. Um, and we'll get to whether you wanna make any changes to those uh, in the next agenda item, but uh, um, that's that's the background. I'm happy to, to go over any, any questions, but uh, if you all would like to make decisions on how to go about reviewing applications, that would be helpful. Mr. Lucas, I've got a quick question. Um, sure. With uh, Mr. Smith having been logged out, I believe we fall below the quorum level, do we not? We're making decisions. We have, Mike Rooker might uh, want to chime in, but I, I believe we have seven voting members. I know Lois. I may be off on that total, so yes. Uh, Ms. Purcell sits in as a non-voting member from Steinsville. Okay. I just want to make sure that we were legally going forward here. Steven, I did want to jump in real quick. I, I'm trying, you said five QSPs, and I'm just doing some mental math here on the ones I'm aware of who won't have merged come 2022 with the district. What five QSPs do you think are out there? And, and I just want to make sure we know the field. I count three. I, I'm, I may be wrong. Last year, we received applications from Benton, uh, Bean Blossom, the Monroe Fire Protection District, and uh, Ellettsville. And, and our plus the same. Those are, those are the five 
providers right now. County folks may know this better than me because I know the commissioners have to do this, but I think that the district will be incorporating both Benton and Washington um, mm -hmm. at the very end of this year. So they won't exist in 2022. So I think we're down to just three QSPs who could apply for 2022. But please, if I've got that wrong, somebody let me know. I, I agree with that count. So the three that are eligible are Benton? It would be it would be Bean Blossom, it would be the district, and Ellettsville. Those would be the only three who could possibly apply. Correction yeah. that would not be Ellettsville, it would be Richland Township. Well, be the Ellettsville Fire Department on behalf, on behalf of, of just the same way that the district could do it on behalf of Salt Creek. Or, right. Or, yeah. Right. Uh, Ron's coming back, it looks like. Thank you for that correction, uh, Mike and, and Jeff. Um, so w with that in mind, I, the Sorry. way the committee handled, hi, Ron, welcome back. Uh, since the storm the other night, uh, my computer internet's been very unstable. Sorry about that. We, we've just been discussing how to go about reviewing applications, and we've uh, uh, just just learned that there there are three possible applicants for funding this year. I believe it's Bean Blossom Township, uh, the Monroe Fire Protection District, and the Town of Ellettsville. And um, prior to uh, the last two years, this committee uh, reviewed applications. Uh, it, it held a meeting, I believe, sometime mid-July, uh, heard presentations from, from the applicants before uh, making a funding recommendation. So um, th those have been the two ways of handling things in the past. Either this committee has reviewed applications or it's requested that the Monroe County Council uh, take on that task. And um, Right, which is what we did last year, correct? Correct. The last two years have have uh, fallen to the, the county council. So um, Jeff may want to weigh in on, on whether uh, that makes sense to do this year. And uh, I, obviously you can discuss amongst yourselves. Yeah. Mr. Chair, may I, may I read um, Cheryl Munson's statement that she mm -hmm. asked to, to read? It's, it's brief, but I think- Please, please, please do, Jeff. Thanks. Uh, Cheryl says, uh, Council Member Munson says, I apologize for not being able to attend the meeting today due to conflicting meetings. Last year, fire departments spent time preparing applications. The County Council com Committee spent time reviewing and ranking applications and preparing recommendations for the PS Lit Committee. And the PS Lit Committee awarded no funding to any of the applicants. The County Council does not want to participate in such a waste of time again for our committee members, the County Council and the fire departments. I think the PS Lit Committee should decide how much PS lit funding will be available says committee to just to, to recommend for awarding then if there is any funding that will be available the fire departments can apply for it and I would be glad to review applications and make recommendations to the County Council and the PS lit committee but if there will be no funding recommended by the committee then none of us has to waste our time with the application and review process I request that you read my letter at the meeting uh, so I mean basically she's saying okay if the number is going to be zero well, you know, we can kind of short circuit some of the process. Of course, they still have an entitlement to apply, but um, maybe, we, maybe we'd want to make it clear if there is no funding. Or I might put it a different way that, uh, particularly for members of the city council who, who last year voted for, for no funding, are, are there any criteria by which you would be interested in considering um, supporting funding? And if so, we ought to at least articulate what those criteria are in advance so that, yeah, nobody nobody has to waste their time on, a, uh, on an application that's not going anywhere. Mr. Underwood? I, I will uh, jump in before uh, my uh, city councilors and do my annual uh, representation on behalf of the city and the administration is uh, we again would ask that this committee recommend that no distributions be made other than in the four units that would normally get the distributions. All of us have pressing needs for this money, uh, as, as we talked about with dispatch. Uh, we all have the same pressures, uh, so we think it would be best to let those monies fall down to the four units as we did last year. And I respectfully ask that you do not provide any additional uh, funding for the eligible units. Thank you. Do we have discussion from uh, other members? 
or questions, concerns? Yeah, actually, I do. Sorry, Sue, you were first. Go ahead. Um, I, I want to check my understanding. I, too, want to acknowledge um, Cheryl's letter. And I want to, Mr. Lucas, this is, I guess, and Mr. Rooker, this is directed at you. I think the PSLIP committee should decide how much PSLIP funding will be available to recommend for awarding. Then, if there is any funding that will be available, the fire departments can apply for it. Um, can we even do that? Can we even pick an amount without ever having seen a proposal for that amount? That feels uncomfortable to me. I think in the past, what this committee has done is set a certain percentage that it would make available uh, up to that amount uh, for applicants who uh, requested funding. And uh, of course, that, that percentage um, yields an amount that can change based on the total amount of revenue that, that uh, we learn about um, at the beginning of August. And so uh, I think that's what Cheryl's referring to in the past. This committee has said 4.5% or, or so, you know, would be available up to that amount would be available for applicants. Um, and uh, I, that's probably what she's referring to. And, and yes, I think you can do that um, if you'd like. And, and I, you know, last year we, we targeted our recommendations at essentially that, that percentage that was similar to the previous year. So that we, we did start from kind of a, a, a approximate ceiling. While yes, it does not necessarily have the force of the full income tax council. Uh, we did in the past start with a ceiling and then work, work down from there. Mr. Alden. I couldn't agree more with what Cheryl just wrote and Jeff read for us. Um, I think it's a waste of time to ask the county council to sort through a, a lot of proposals. Um, we're down to, as we've talked about, three qualified providers. I don't think that's too much to ask the PS Lit Committee to wade through. Um, quite honestly, um, and I, I voiced this last year and I will continue to voice this this year, I think we should consider emergency funding requests. I mean, if they can verify that this is truly an emergency and we have to have this, as we did a few years ago with the SCBA tanks, that we should most certainly look at that. Um, but some of the wish lists that have come before this, this committee in the last four or five years have been, um, at least in my mind, problematic as it relates to general fund monies versus what is supposed to be supplemental funding. Um, quite honestly, I would be in favor of looking at the emergency level funding. Um, but beyond that, I would uh, kind of concur with Mr. Underwood that uh, it should go to the four qualified providers or the four providers that are certified, and then they can distribute monies as they see fit to um, other parties as they wish. Appreciate that. Anyone else have a comment? Um, on the process here, Mr. Sims. Thank you. Um, I, I would agree with um, Councilmember Oldham, but I, I guess what I was wondering: should there be, or can there be, a definition of emergency request, or is that something that um, surfaces throughout the application process and then determined by the group? Um, and as he said, the, the SCBAs. I think we all pretty much agreed. As I recall, those tanks were either expired or due to expire very soon and definitely needed those breathing apparatus. And, and I thought we uh, made those recommendations because of that. So is that is that what you're talking about, Councilmember Oldham? Something like that when we see the application, it's kind of like you know it when you see it. Yes. Um, you know, again, it, it kind of contrasts that with over the years, we've seen requests for pickup trucks and for other pieces of apparatus that, quite frankly, I think we all agreed should have been planned for under the general fund. Um, the SCBAs absolutely would have been an emergency request because there was supposed to have been funding and then that was cut. And then we were getting into the area where they were going to expire and put people's lives at risk. So I, I I don't know that coming up with a definition, at least I would find it a little problematic, but it's kind of like you just said, we know it when we see it. Thank you. Mr. Lucas. I'll just point out to the committee that the guidelines that have been used in the past uh, do express that the committee prefers to fund, uh, ex to fund expenditures for demonstrated urgent one-time needs. Um, I, I think if, if there was further clarification that the committee wanted to make about uh, some sort of emergency uh, request that that might be the place to uh, to add language, um, but certainly coming up with the definition is is difficult. 
And does does it say preferred? Is that word used preferred? It says the, the committee prefers to fund expenditures for demonstrated urgent one-time needs. I mean, you could use stronger language if you wanted, um, if that would uh, make things uh, a little clearer, if that was the direction that the committee wanted to go in. And, and I'll, but before we get into changing language in, in the application or, or the, uh, the guidelines, um, it sounds like there's a sentiment to not delegate review of the applications to the county council. Is that what I'm hearing? I would agree. It makes no sense, given yeah. that only three potential yeah. applicants. Yeah. And, and I, I think that that's the default. <laughs> uh, the, this committee was set up to review those applications, so I don't think you need to make any motion in that regard. Um, uh, so if, if there is no motion to delegate, this, this committee will review the applications, and um, that, that does lead into our next two agenda items, which is review of the application form itself and the guidelines, uh, as, as well as the schedule. And, and I should note, I, I believe on the agenda, um, the remaining items uh, listed an opportunity for public comment, unless the committee feels otherwise. Um, so I don't know if, if you all would like to offer up an opportunity for public comment before moving on. Um, sure. I have no problem with that. Uh, um, should any member of the public uh, wish to make a comment um, on the uh, pr proceed, uh, what has gone just before, uh, and it's about us. Is it uh, specifically about us reviewing the applications this year? Then uh, please uh, raise your hand or send a note in the chat to Mr. Lucas and he will recognize you and we will entertain your comments. Thank you. And while we're waiting, I, I, uh, the committee may want to think about, I, I know uh, Jeff mentioned uh, in the past uh, using a set percentage. I, I think this would be an opportunity if the committee uh, wanted to set uh, any sort of percentage, it, it could do so now. Uh, you don't, you're not required to at this point, but uh, if you all knew that uh, something like that is what you'd want to do, um, now might be the time to talk about that. Well, I, I have a question on that is if uh, if we set a percentage and then we get some applications and um, say they one of three rises to the level of an emergency and so there's additional funds left over, what happens to the additional funds? Mr. Rooker is going to weigh in. I didn't mean to jump in on, on Mr. Lucas. I would. I did just want to comment that when percentages were set in the past for a distribution, it wasn't done at this early of a date. Um, I may have misunderstood it. Maybe Mr. McKim can correct. But I, I read Cheryl, uh, Council Committee Member Munson's statement to be more, if it's going to be zero, we'd like to know that at the outset, not necessarily that you have to pick a percentage at this moment. Uh, maybe I'm misunderstanding what you're saying. I, I, I mean, not not wanting to speak to her. I mean, all, all I the only communication I have from her is that letter. But I, I would I would generally agree that that's the that's the philosophy that if it's going to be zero, let's not waste our time. But it, it sounds like at least that I hear that there are committee members here are at least open to uh, requests of an urgent nature. And, and perhaps I, sh I should uh, clarify just a bit. I, I believe the years where uh, maybe it was two years ago when when uh, the job of reviewing applications was delegated to the county council, I do believe there was a percentage set ahead of ahead of that. Given that that's not the case this year, it, it may not make sense to to set any sort of ceiling. You you may just want to see what the applications say and and go from there. Um, so I just wanted to to raise that in case anyone cared to make a motion in that regard, but. Uh, what do people feel? Shall we just let it be a, a vague number that we will fund something if it rises to the level of an emergency or urgency? I think we need to, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I think we, I think speaking as one committee member, I would be willing to leave that possibility open, but I wouldn't be willing to commit um, to a certain number of dollars or a percentage that would ordinarily be reviewed by the county without having seen a single proposal. That just doesn't make sense to me. And it, particularly since we're reviewing all the proposals, um, anybody seeking funds 
seeking a grant or seeking a, a philanthropic dollars, you can always request and you don't know if you're going to get it. That's, that's not unusual. So I, I appreciate the uncertainty that comes with this process, but I think that's part of any fund seeking process. So okay. thank you. Mr. McKim. Yeah, I think that in the direct, the direction that this committee is clearly going with the guidance, I don't think it makes any sense to set a, an a priori uh, amount to, to fund. I think we, we set, I mean, it is their right to, to make applications. You just say that this committee is only going to consider applications of, uh, of an urgent nature, whatever the, uh, the language that, uh, that the committee would like to use to convey that. I'm great with that. Is everybody else okay with that? Absolutely. Okay, do we need a, diff, uh, a certain type of motion on that, Mr. Lucas? No, I, I don't believe you need any motion in that regard. And I've, I've not seen any requests for public comment on, uh, on the conduct of, of review of applications. So if the committee is ready to move on to reviewing the application form itself along with the guidelines, um, it, it could do so now. And again, just a brief history here. Last year, this uh, committee simplified the application uh, somewhat in an attempt to make it easier for applicants to, to, uh, to file it. Um, I know in the past there have been requests for uh, more uh, budget information uh, that was, I, I think, removed last year uh, to, again, streamline the process a bit for applicants. So um, your packet has both the application and the guidelines. If, if the committee has any changes it would like to make, it uh, could do so. I believe the application, uh, the first page lists some just uh, uh, basic instructions on, on deadlines to apply and, and where those applications can be sent. Um, I believe in the past, the applicants have been submitted to the county council office, given that they were going to review, uh, review those. Um, it might make sense uh, this year to have the applications directed to uh, the city city council office, if, if you'd like to do that. Uh, the deadline in the past, uh, again, has been set at June 30th uh, at 12 noon. Um, the, the deadline uh, under state statute is before July 1st, so uh, that, that deadline makes sense to give them the maximum amount of time to apply. Um, if there are any specific changes, so I, I say all that to, uh, to mean that uh, staff will be happy to update those instructions given what the committee decides here today. Last year, I think the final approval of, of any language in the application or the guidelines was delegated to the committee chair just to make sure everything was correct. But if there, if there are specific changes you all want to make here at this meeting, you could do so. Does anyone have any specific changes on the application form? I think just as long as, as the guidelines are, are reworded to make sure that it's clear that only urgent needs will be considered, just so we don't lead anybody down the, you know, yes. down a path that, would, that, that wastes their time. I'm, I'm good with the application as it exists. Thank you, Mr. McKim, on uh, that comment, because uh, that was going to be my comment too. Mr. Lucas, can we uh, strengthen, make it more robust that it's urgent and emergency need? Yes, I, so it sounds like what the committee might want to say in the guidelines uh, under number two, purpose of the expenditure, the committee will only consider funding expenditures for demonstrated urgent emergency one-time needs. How does that yeah. sound to everyone? That makes Mr. sense. Do you need a motion to that effect? Mr. Sims would like to come make a comment. No, I was just going to say that sounds fine. Um, but in the past, and I was wondering about um, presentations um, from some of the QSPs. Um, in the past, they made presentations on their applications. So uh, uh, from a process standpoint, if this committee were to review the applications and then decide um, that no funding would be warranted, for an example, then there'd be no need for presentations. So uh, I just want us to remember that, that if we do decide, then I, do, I would want to hear from the applicants if it was decided by this committee that there was um, uh, an urgent 
a demonstrated urgent one-time need, if, if that makes sense. I think that sounds yeah. fine to me. Everybody else well, okay one, with that? One of the main things I will say in the past is there was, I, I don't want to say confusion um, as we were moving along the path of, of fire territories, um, but obviously some townships were um, preserving funds in order to, to for that move. Um, and, and I was always interested in those funds um, along with the need for the requested funds. And that was always served well, at least I think um, in the, the, in the, pres the actual presentation where we could ask questions and have a little bit of a back and forth. So that was my only uh, uh, idea from a process standpoint. Um, Ultimately, I would think, and if this committee decides that no funding would be recommended, then there'd be no need for the steps after that, if that makes sense. Great. Yes. Great. And, and Mr. Lucas, can we make sure that um, that kind of language uh, that excludes, you know, that includes the people that the QSPs who are deemed uh, appropriate for urgent and emergency, can that be clear in the um, guidelines so that we don't, as Mr. Sim says, lead anybody down um, a garden path or whatever? Perhaps I can ask a clarifying question. It, it sounds like the committee would like to first review the applications that come in before deciding whether to invite folks to present. Is that mm -hmm. what I'm? Yes. Yes. Yes, and I think at the next agenda item scheduling future meetings, um, you could decide on a date where you would like to review those applications uh, while leaving enough time uh, to hear from applicants if you'd like. Um, but yes, we can certainly make that clear in the uh, solicitation materials that go out to the uh, possible applicants. Thank you. Um, Ms. Gambaleri. Yes. Um, a question, Mr. Lucas, you asked, are there any modifications we need to make? Um, and I see a couple points in the application that I could see the wording creating some confusion. Um, and But I want to check myself on that. Do you or do any of my fellow committee members have a sense? Is there language in here that has been a source of confusion in the past or in recent years? We cleaned it up quite a bit last year, I know. But Scott? I'm oh, sorry, it's not my call, but... <laughs> I think one of the biggest things that's been confusing over the years is, is who can apply and what capacity they can apply. And I, I think, uh, you know, Council Member Sims is exactly correct. I think we had some thoughts um, as time went on that there were applications being made that probably should have belonged in whatever that political body's general funds were, and they were actually supplementing funds with PS lit as opposed to anything else. Um, that's just my take on it. I think other than that, it was fairly straightforward. Mm -hmm. So let me follow up on that. Section five, Roman numeral five, significant sources of revenue. Um, please list the other sources or sources of potential funding, I would suggest we, we say. Uh, your efforts to obtain funding from those sources and how these services are currently being funded. Has that, has that created any confusion for anybody? They understand? applicants have understood sufficiently that they need to list all potential sources there. Because I think that's a not inconsequential question. So. I, I personally don't have the answer to that. I don't think that uh, it's ever become a point of controversy for us to the point where it was raised beyond, you know, kind of the honor system of having them fill it out as, as they read the question. Yeah. I mean, that hasn't risen to the, you know, to, to my attention either, so. I, okay, I don't want to create a challenge where there isn't one, so, okay. No, well, if I can jump in, I think that's pretty um, clear cut and straightforward. Um, and I think most applications, um, as, as far as I know, were fairly upfront about that. One of the things that um, I was concerned about was funds that were already in their possession and encumbered elsewhere, potentially, but sitting aside, but not part of this discussion. Right. Um, and that was one, one of the, the, the concerns I had. 
if, if that made sense. Okay, sure. Um, so I think we probably, Mr. Lucas, do you have enough from us now um, for that section and for the guidelines to make to make it as clear as um, we're we're kind of asking for? I believe so. I, I think it may be a good idea for this committee to delegate uh, review of the final language of all these materials to the to the chair just to make sure it uh, uh, comports with what we've discussed here today. I think there's a few specific um, mentions within the questions to years that will need to be updated. So we'll we'll make that all make sense. But I'd, I'd suggest that the committee delegate review of the uh, uh, the final application and guidelines to the chair um, before those go out. And okay, I would either make or support that motion. That's fine. And I will second. All right. And I will call the roll. Mr. McKim? Yes. Ms. Scambaluri? Yes. Mr. Oldham? Yes. Mr. Sims? Yes. Mr. Smith says yes as well. So I will look over and uh, you will all trust me with uh, um, making that it looks good and clear. Uh, thank you very much. Do we need a motion uh, for anything else, Mr. Lucas? Well, if, if you want to go to the public on, on uh, I suppose, any of those uh, applications or guidelines before we move on, uh, I think the agenda listed an opportunity for public comment. Um, but the okay, we will entertain public comment now. Uh, and uh, perhaps uh, public comment three minutes or uh, at the very most um, to comment on the guidelines and the application. And uh, you can send a chat to Mr. Lucas or raise your hand should you be on the Zoom call with us. Anybody, any takers? I see no takers. Okay, um, then we can come back to uh, the process. Uh, do we need a um, further motion on the other items today that we talked about? Are we? The, the, the remaining item is, is the schedule. And if the committee uh, plans to uh, review applications, um, I think the next step would be to set a date to do that. And it sounds like the committee would like to first review applications, decide if it wants to hear from uh, any of those folks um, before inviting them to present. And so I know in the past, uh, the committee has met in, in early to mid July um, to do that review and uh, typically meets toward the end of July or early August to make its final uh, recommendations back to the tax council, uh, given the, uh, the revenue estimates that come from the state, uh, right at the start of August. So I would look for a meeting sometime early to mid July, if, if you'd like to do that, uh, to review applications. Again, those, those will be due by, uh, June 30th. Um, uh, Mr. Lucas, can you look on your calendar and, uh, is uh, Thursday at 4 p.m. somewhere in mid-July okay with everyone? So are we speaking about the 15th? Is this, is this to review applications? It is to review applications. And I don't know I was, if, uh, I think Mr. I was, Lucas is going to look at the date. I, yes, Mr. I was, Sims. I was just thinking more about the 8th, since we only have three possible applicants. Um, and they're due by... July 30th, so that would give us two weeks, roughly. No, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I will actually little, be gone that little, week. Oh, but I will okay. also okay. be gone that week. Okay. Well, scratch that thing. Okay. <laughs> scratch July 8th. Uh, Mr. Lucas, see some other dates there? July 15th is the next Thursday, and Again, I, I would just keep in mind um, that the applicants, if, if they are invited to present, may need to know that <laughs> um, ahead of time. And so if you'd, if you'd like to reserve a date uh, now, 
uh, four presentations. If, if folks are invited, that, that might also be a good idea. But uh, um, July 15th is, is the Thursday after July 8th. And it sounds like 4 p.m. may work for folks. Uh, of course, we've got a couple of committee members that aren't here today um, that hopefully will be able to make it at that time. That day and time works for me. I would also just ask the question, would we meet in person or via Zoom at that point? Good question. Because it's July and presumably the health, the health decree is gonna expire by then. I, I believe we'll be under the new uh, state statute and assuming the health emergency uh, is not extended, I will need at least a majority of you in person. I mean, that's fine. I just wanted to clarify. All right, does that change anybody's mind? About no, 15th is fine. Okay. Perhaps we could set that date and then leave the exact time open for other committee members to weigh in. Four o'clock may be problematic for a couple. Good, Good idea. idea. Good idea. In person. All right. And then, uh, Mr. Lucas, you think we need to set a date also for the final vote? It, it, if it makes sense to the committee, and I'm not sure that it does, I'm, I'm just thinking out loud here, if, if you want to reserve a date to hear presentations from agencies, if any are invited to, to come before the committee, it might be good to let them know what that data is well in advance. Um, but uh, that's, that's up to you all. How much, um, how much notice does a, an applicant need to prepare for a presentation? Any of they have a sense of that? Is a week sufficient? In what? other words, it, if we deliberate on the 15th, can we extend invitations to present on the 22nd, one week later? Or is that well, not uh, enough turnaround time? This is just me personally, but I would think that the application itself um, would be the content of the presentation. In, I, in, yeah. addition, in addition to any questions that we would have, um, and I would further, and I hope this is enough time, I was going to suggest July 20th um, for any presentations, if it was deemed on the 15th, um, that that would be required or requested. Um, and my rationale there is that's our last day of council recess. Um, and then we could at least take care of this portion of PS lit before, provided it, it fits for everybody else. Okay, sounds fair. Mr. McKim. And I have no problem with those those dates either. I, I guess on the on the presentation, um, you know, I I kind of agree that they're, they're, the presentation is going to be their application. So really, what we're talking about is question and answers. Yes. Maybe that's maybe we fra frame it that way is is yes. discussion or responding to committee questions. And and I guess the other question I have is will will our chair be empowered to cancel these meetings if we, for example, have no applications? I, I would recommend that, that a motion be made to both schedule these meetings and, and empower the chair to, to do just that. All right, I'll take motions. So what were those dates again? 20th for presentation and 22nd for a vote. Is that what we're thinking? For a vote? Oh. 15th for initial deliberation. Too. That's, yeah, yeah, July 15th for yeah. the, and 22nd for uh, potential presentations and, uh, and a vote. Is that, is that what we're no, saying? No, the 20th was the presentation. 20th, 20th. Yeah, 20th. That's, a, that's a Tuesday. Okay. okay. Those, those two dates. And the 22nd? Uh, no, that was my error. Pardon okay, me. okay. All right, so then I would move that we uh, set the next two meetings as July 15th and July 20th at the specific time to be determined after consultation by staff with all committee members. And also that we empower the committee chair to cancel said meetings if we have no applications. And I'll second. second. Oh. All right, I'll call the roll, Mr. Sims. Yes. Mr. McKim? Yes. Ms. Scambellori? Yes. Mr. Oldham? Yes. Mr. Smith also votes yes. 
So that passes five not at this point. Anything else, Mr. Lucas, that is important for our, uh, to conclude our agenda here? Uh, Mr. Oldham? Just quick question for either Mr. Lucas or maybe Mr. Underwood can answer. There is nothing under the law that prohibits any of the certified providers making a sub award to anyone else they choose concerning this, correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you very much. Any other concluding questions or concerns that people have? Just another quick note that uh, there may be one more meeting needed if, if this committee wants to actually recommend, well, regardless of whether the committee recommends funding uh, for the uh, applicants, uh, there will likely be an, uh, a meeting needed for this committee to review the PSAP request uh, that, that's funded out of the PS lit uh, and to set that amount. So um, we don't necessarily need to schedule that meeting uh, today, but that's typically happened early August uh, after uh, the state releases its, uh, its estimates right around the August 1st or August 2nd uh, timeline. So, um, and, and I think we, I know we haven't had any members of the public take us up on comments, but uh, we did offer up an opportunity on the agenda for comments on the schedule, uh, if there are any uh, members of the public that, that wanted to comment on that. Members of the public can send a note to Mr. Lucas or raise their hand if they would like to comment on the agenda on the schedule. Any takers, Mr. Lucas? I don't see any, no. Okay. Uh, do we have any concerns about the, uh, the de date referenced by Mr. Lucas for uh, um, the other allocation? Okay, we'll let that go for now. Okay, Ms. Scambalori. And just a friendly request, when you have a space reserved, could you confirm it for us too, for, the, for those who are gonna be in person? It's normally it's been in council chambers, I think. Has it? Um, okay, so we, yes. I, sometimes we're in Natu Hill, so for other stuff, so. okay. Yes. So just assume council chambers. Okay, it will be council chambers. Um, but just, so, just on that point, we'll, we'll We'll make sure that the room's available if, if yeah. we'll, we'll get with the committee, but uh, uh, assuming the room's available at, at, on those dates and, and at the time that's yet to be determined, um, if, if that works for the committee, we'll, we'll plan on council chambers here at City. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, anything else for the good of the cause? All right. This meeting is concluded. Everybody signify by saying aye. Hi. 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 <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll talk to you soon. That's good. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks for stepping up, Councilman Smith. Sure.